Thanks, Justin. Thank you. All right, so this is something that you have talked about and thought about and worked on a lot. Yes. Um, and I'm really, I think empowerment is a word people use a lot. I'm very curious to know how you view empowerment and what that means at Asana, what it looks like at Asana. Yeah, and what you mentioned a minute ago of that you want to have people who are, who are geniuses in their own right. Like in a lot of organizations, it feels like a waste of your own talent if you're an individual contributor and you're just being, you're just a cog in, in the machine, you're just being told what to do. So, and in, in fact, part of the culture from Asana comes from the fact that I, I've been an individual contributor at other companies and, and had that sort of feeling of being under leveraged. And so we think of empowerment as like, how can we move as much of the actual decision making to the people who are doing the work? Right? But, Amen. 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 A lot of that's also about clarity. So there, there's often ambiguity in an organization about who gets to make the call, which is frustrating in a whole mm -hmm. host of ways. It's You end up being like, do we need to get five people in a room and get consensus? Do we need to run this by some executive leadership? So we have a system called Areas of Responsibility, or AORs, where as much as possible, every single thing in the company falls into some AOR. So that might be the security AOR, or that might be the co corporate values AOR. And then each of those AORs has a, a directly responsible individual who is the owner. And while, while there are extreme cases where they might need to be overruled by someone more senior, in 99% of the, of the cases, they're the person who is making the final call. And they may interview, you know, they, we, we expect people to actually talk to all of the re relevant stakeholders, but sort of to make a judgment call on like, either this is something that I can just make the decision on and just make the call and go on, or this is something that it's worth me talking to several different people. But regardless, you don't need to get consensus. You're actually empowered to just make that final decision. And so e even when it comes to something like uh, the design of a product, when we do design reviews in a traditional company, if you know, I'm the, the head of product at Asana, if someone in, in most companies, if someone were to come and do a design review and I were to give them feedback like, I think that button should be blue, they're going to make that button blue. Here, in, in almost all cases, it's more of, I'm just giving advice, sometimes strongly worded advice. <laughs> um, but it's just like, it, it really is like, here's the things that I would solve, here's the things I would do. And in some cases, you can't ship this until you solve this problem, but how they solve the problem is ultimately up mm -hmm, to them. Mm -hmm. And so that, that just allows us to hire, I think, a, a much higher caliber of people because they're just, you know, that, that's, people want to be able to, to exercise their own judgment. Yeah, I'm curious about that specific thing, because I read something that you said once where one of your better employees was saying, like, this is the hardest thing about working at Asana. <laughs> like, the fact that I actually have so much empowerment is challenging. So what does that mean about the kind of person you attract in and the kind of person who's, like, not interested? Yeah, I think people often will fantasize about, oh, I wish I was the decision maker on this. <laughs> and it's like, all right, now you're the decision maker. Right? What, what, <laughs> what, are you your mouth what are you going to do? Um, and that's just a growth opportunity for people. And yeah, and some people are like, you know, on second thought, I would rather just make some, some things and have someone else make those hard decisions. But, uh, but I think people just experience it usually as a growth edge of, okay, I have to live with the consequences of these decisions, learn from things. And we have, we have tons, you know, in order to make this viable, yeah. we have tons of support structures. So the primary role of management at Asana, you know, instead of being like a delegation function, is a coaching function understand what are the things that people need in order to succeed, understand what are the things that they're anxious about in making decisions or in any part of their role. Um, we also offer uh, executive coaching for, for everyone in the company and lots of other mm -hmm. things like that to help make those decisions easier. And then, over, and also we have reflection processes so that when things do go wrong, we have structured things like five whys um, where you, you ask, you know, where, where they will sit with a group of people who will help them introspect on like, well, what went wrong and why? And why did that happen and why did that happen? so we can take incremental steps to improving it. But, if, but a critical part of that is that the culture needs to embrace failure and experimentation yeah. at a level where when someone does something you know, that, that messes up instead of being like, well, we can never trust them with that again. Instead, it's a culture of, oh, wow, you, you messed that up? Like, now you've learned a bunch. You should, we, we should put you on more projects like that since you're more experienced now. Do you end up having to have those conversations with new candidates where you're like, so, don't be afraid. Yes, it's a lot of, you know, you get to make the decision, but here are all of the things that we do when the decision goes wrong. Because I think so much of that hesitance must come out of their 
fear from probably past experiences that they'll have retribution if something goes wrong. Yeah, and so we try to just really embody that in the culture of celebrating failures, talking about when experiments that we run don't succeed, here's what we learn from those experiments. Um, I, I think just the, the, another big aspect of the culture for us is equanimity, mm. which kind of goes into mm -hmm. it's like an, an extreme version of the uh, no fear, yeah. or, 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 fear free or, or no workplace. yelling. Yeah, and that, yes. <laughs> Um, I, I just can't imagine being in a culture, or not, not that I can't imagine, but like my tolerance for being in a place where people are going to yell at each other is <laughs> so low. Zero. Zero. And like, you, I think people sometimes have this feeling, I think there's a common mistake that you have two options. You can either be extremely stressed out, but like passionate and results driven, and the only way you're gonna get, achieve great things is if everyone is just like, yelling at each other and really, really feels this pressure of we've got to do it right. Or you can be a lazy hippie who like, doesn't take the job very seriously, doesn't, re doesn't really care whether it goes right, but at least you get to ha hang out and have fun. And I just, th th that's not a spectrum. Those are two perpendicular axes. It's totally possible. In fact, I think more effective to, mm -hmm. for accomplishing your goals if you can have extreme passion for the outcome that you're trying to, to achieve at the same time as being equanimous as being emotionally receptive to the possibility that it may work out or it may not work out. And by embodying that as a culture and you know, leadership and at this point, the entire company, I think to, to some extent, having this feeling like this didn't go well, that's a bummer. We're gonna reflect on it and calmly, intellectually, equanimously work to resolve it. I think just goes a long way in people being like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna get yelled at if I make a mistake and yeah. that allows people to make bolder, bolder decisions. Yeah. So it's like ambitious hippie. It's not work on. <laughs> extremely ambitious, extreme extremely hippie, ambitious. yeah. <laughs> hippie has a lot of connotations. I, but I know. We I only know. We might need we, to, we to claim half, that. Half of those connotations but, are accurate. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's interesting that you're talking about equanimity in this room where people know what that word means. And I think so <laughs> much so much of that. Um, so much of, you know, in, as I was just talking, I was thinking about you and some of what I've read about your own personal growth and development practices. That stuff definitely, like, it communicates and people can see and feel it. I don't, do, is there anything you wanna share about, like, what you do in your own uh, sort of spiritual and, and emotional and physical and other practices? Yeah, I think, I, I'm just, in general, still really stunned by the existence of the universe. <laughs> it never gets old. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's really weird, right? I'm not, I'm not the only one who's noticed this, right? It's like really, really weird. The whole 3D space thing. And, oh, and also consciousness. Yes. Which, you may have noticed you have a subjective experience, or at least I do, I don't know about you. But, but like that is also very strange. And, and so I've just been like deeply engaged. I, I, I just can't imagine not like every day taking that pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. It's like, I would like to really understand what's going on. I would like to really introspect on like, what is the nature of reality? What is the nature of, of my consciousness? And uh, fortunately, there's a ton of technology that, or, and techniques and, and wisdom that's been developed over thousands of years for how to do those introspective processes, how to think about that stuff. Um, and you know, that looks like meditation and yoga and qigong um, and c uh, conscious leadership training that uh, I've done with Diana that's incredible. And there's, a, there's an element of like going inside and developing, I mean, I could talk forever about what you learn from spirituality, which yeah. I don't mean in any, sec secular, yeah, secular, sec secular We're all spirituality. trying to get around these like really loaded terms. So Self-discovery, but... the, the, the inner journey. Um, one of the biggest things is just, I noticed at some point that I, and it seemed like a lot of people spend almost their entire life distracting themselves from the moment, mm -hmm. the, the, from the, the eternal now, which is a, is a combination of like, I think the more, more I've, I've felt into it, the more that the present moment feels both like the most beautiful thing, if not the only beautiful mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. uh, and also really intense, like the more you relax into it, it's, it's quite uncomfortable in a lot of ways. And so meditation and these, these practices are a way of like sinking into that. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of things just become obvious and easy in that mm -hmm. state of mind. Like the idea of getting triggered and yelling at someone, you realize like, oh, they're not the problem. Like I, they can do whatever they want. It's me, it's my inside that's reacting to that that's the problem. Um, 
and so there's all these things that are, are basically common, well understood across wisdom traditions, mm -hmm. and yet that, to me, bizarrely, don't get incorporated into the way that we build organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just have never understood that. And so uh, uh, I, I'm, I love, I mean, it's, it's obviously, I celebrate mm -hmm. getting things like the you know, recognition from, from that right. Asana's doing right. so well on culture, but a lot of it to me just falls out really naturally from just taking those things that have been developed in wisdom traditions and that come from that inward journey and just being like, well, of course we want to run a company that way too, and that's just what falls out. Yeah, I know when we were talking earlier, a couple weeks back, you said something that kind of stuck with me. It was clear to me that you had a, a, a very clear like internal compass around like, there are just things that we do because they are the right thing to do, period. Like there is a little bit of a storyline in business that's like, if you do the right thing, it's great for business too, right? Okay, yes and. You <laughs> were like, right, and also it's just the right thing to do, so why aren't we all doing that? Yeah, we've gotten to this place where uh, the pursuit of profit, I think, is the modern religion, right? Mm -hmm. that, yes. <laughs> that, um, and I, I separate, you know, there, there's the sort of pure wisdom of, of, of religious traditions and there's the dogma. Mm -hmm. and, right. and in this case I'm talking about, the, there's, a, there's a dogma around well, what we need to do is just align with whatever creates the most profit. And it's just, it's, it's as, it's as random mm -hmm. <laughs> and ridiculous as like any, any of the wor worship of, of yeah. you know, Greek gods or something. Yeah. Um, we know it doesn't lead to happiness. We know there's all these problems. Now, it's also extremely important. Like Asana's a for-profit company. We think it's critical that we be wildly profitable in order to be able to have the resources to invest in hiring the best people and getting all the servers that we need and, and all the stuff we need. But, it's, but money is very clearly a means toward an end for us rather than an end in itself. Uh, and so, in, yeah, I, I constantly hear people in talking about conscious business being like, well, if you're mindful at work, that's going to lead to more money. If you stop yelling at each other, that's going to improve your bottom line. And, and fortunately, it's true, which is convenient. I, I don't know what we would do if, if it weren't. Right. Um, it, 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 it's beautiful that it works out that way. But, but to say, like, the reason that we're going to, to try to yeah. have clarity of purpose and all be aligned on the same page and, and uh, everyone understanding what their work is working toward, or, or the, yeah, as, as, a, as a means toward an end of money, to me, is, is missing the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I heard you, I'm going to shift back to the empowerment lens briefly. Um, I heard you say that as you're communicating to employees or, or as employees begin to work in this framework of empowerment, um, that you said the, the phrase, like, they know that the company has entrusted this decision to them. Um, and, you know, I'm a fan of everything communicates, and I do think for the co-founder of a company to be using that kind of phrase, like, we tr entrust this to you about, like, basically everything, is powerful. Tell me, tell me how employees receive that. Yeah, and one thing I'll point out is you, you, we've also gone too far and swung the pendulum too far in the other direction of giving people empowerment before they were ready for it. So mm. you have, you, and that can sometimes lead to this feeling of, or, or actually a false empowerment, right? Where it's mm. like, this is your decision, and then it's like, oh no, you, that's no, we really can't let you make that decision, right? <laughs> so so you you want to, to stage things in a way where it's like, okay, at first we're gonna empower, we're going to tr entrust you to do this entire piece of the work. And then at a certain point, now you're ready for being trusted in this level and this level. And that way it's, it's really sincere at any, at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just about the company entrusting them. We also have to work hard to make to be clear that everyone needs to trust them. Because mm -hmm. pretty much any time someone makes a big decision, especially because you weren't in the room thinking through all the pros and cons, especially the, as the as organizations grow and you don't even know the person making the decision, I think it's often human nature to just immediately be like, that's a terrible decision. If I was in their yeah. shoes, I would do something different. And it's like the flip side of empowerment is trust. And so we also have to really just keep reminding people like, look, you have, like, this may have not been the decision you would have made, but this person has so much more information on the topic th than right. you do. And you also have kind of have to ask for, tr for faith in the organizational structure as a whole, that if that person makes a mistake, we will be able to undo it and reflect on it. And if they consistently uh, keep making mistakes that you know, one of their manager's areas of responsibility is to be monitoring their performance and mm -hmm. shrinking or growing their, their areas appropriately. Um, so it, it's, 
it's a delicate dance where like all these things kind of have to work together. If you don't have trust, you don't have real empowerment. If, if you don't have uh, systems in order to, to self-correct when things go wrong, empowerment leads to chaos. And so yeah. you have to have all these things in place. Can you share a little bit about how your thinking on empowerment intersects with your thinking about like the world in general and how people, what, how people work? Well, beyond empowerment, I think just in general, like the reason I'm so passionate about culture is it's, cu culture refers to the way that humans interact with each other, mm -hmm. right? And that encompasses so many things. And in general, I think that culture is mindless, j just in this literal sense of like, people don't normally stop and reflect, how am I showing up in human interactions? How do I want to communicate? When we're in a group of people, how do we want to relate to each other and what, what's gonna lead to us being able to rise to our best selves and achieve the best outcomes? And bringing mindfulness to that and being like, okay, let's stop and, and, and ask these questions. What would lead to those optimal outcomes is, is rare. And that, that distinction applies, I'd say, across, you know, whether you're talking about like a, a, everything from like a two-person you know, friendship or romantic couple all the way up to the culture that we have internationally, geopolitically, the culture of our nation, the, cu the culture of, of giant companies and small companies. And the, the solutions that we need are different in all these cases, right? You can't, like, you can't top-down design the culture of the United States, and you wouldn't want to. And, but but, but the, the general attention and, and holding the question of like, how do we want to interact with each other as, as people? How, how, do we, how do we want to include each other in the right ways, be respectful, empower each other in, in some in, in, in both subtle and direct senses as we interact with each other. I think those are important questions that, that we can all hold. And you know, we're talking about this at a company culture level, but hopefully the more we engage with these questions, the more that can spread to all those different levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have just a minute left. I wanted to share with you, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, but in marketing, especially at bigger companies where there's lots of layers, um, there's a phrase where people talk about, it's always the junior marketers talking about the frozen tundra of middle management, uh, where there's so much marketing is subjective. You know, there's a lot of second guessing and Monday mm -hmm. morning quarterbacking about whether something was good or not, and there's a lot of fear. So it's sort of thought of that this middle layer of management is where dis creativity goes to die. <laughs> you know, what? And I'm sure that that sort of thing, sort of uh, artifact, exists in other. Uh, functions. What, is, what would your co career advice be to someone who is in a, a situation like that? Who's in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. In a company that has, you know, this frozen group of decision making is stuck. You want, you want to diagnose how deep that problem runs, right? If the problem is deep in the DNA of the organization and you have the luxury of being able to choose where you work, you might just want to work at a different place. And I think people... Wait, people, can you say that louder? <laughs> you might just want to work in a different place. I, generally, when people quit jobs, their, their misgiving is that they wish they had done it sooner. Um, but, the, but, the, in, but if you're in a position where you can start to influence the organization, especially if you're in a leadership role, I think recognizing the, the yeah that the nature of creativity is that you are going to take bold move bold moves that doing design by committee having everything be be the result of consensus mm -hmm. or manager approval quickly leads to yeah me, to, to mediocrity just in the literal sense of like mm -hmm. if you average a bunch of opinions it is in the middle it is mediocre uh, we actually when we we've never drawn the the org chart because management is more of a an AOR an area of responsibility mm -hmm. than, than a power structure. But we often say, if we were to draw the org chart, we would draw it uh, with the CEO at the bottom and coming up like a tree with the idea that the, the function of managers is, is not to dictate, it's to support in the way the function of branches is to support. And the individual contributors are the, the fruits of that tree, the people who are actually doing the work, the people who ideally are the actual geniuses making the great decisions. And becoming, become, becoming a, a manager, we don't call a promotion, we think of it as going more into a service role in which you can help mentor other people to, to manifest their genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, that's our time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.